So on the phone with us now is the great Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. And of course, it's an exciting time. It's the 50th anniversary of Jethro Tull. Got a world tour coming up. So we're going to get right into this interview and we're going to touch on all aspects and wrap up your whole life and the length of this call. So I, I want to start. I want to go back to Aqualung 1971, one of the greatest albums of all time. And there was constant talk that it was a concept album. So this irked you. So in response, you released your next album, Thick as a Brick, as a parody of a concept album. And I thought it was just so hysterical. I actually have the album in front of me. And I, I just want to know if you could like talk us through the concept and uh, what you were thinking at this time. Well, uh, the, the, the album Aqualung, whilst you know, I, I always maintained that it shouldn't be called a concept album, I could understand why people um, might think in that direction, partly because it was fashionable and becoming more fashionable for artists to make concept albums. And so this seemed to be, I suppose, in the minds of certainly music writers and to some extent the public, it seemed a natural progression. But there was indeed, you know, some some element that brought these songs together, which was really more in terms of the the album cover and the way that the uh, the music was presented. I mean, back days in those days of vinyl, you had the opportunity to make big pictures and you know try and get things to coalesce in a way that allowed you to uh, bring a bunch of disparate songs together under one banner. But it didn't make it a concept album. There were perhaps a few songs that had some relation to each other, but not a single concept running through it. But, um, you know, we were very fortunate. People liked the record, and it was uh, something that gave me the the chance to stretch out a little bit and write songs, many of which were more acoustic and and uh, recorded sometimes just by me on my own rather than all the band in the studio. So it was a, you know, a varied album, singer-songwriter kind of album with some Sort of tougher rock elements in it and so when we came to do take us a break the follow-up and the and make it in some ways a bit of a parody use that word parody of a, of a concept album that was part of it but I, I think in so doing it also became truly a concept album <laughs> and the the nature of it was light-hearted a little bit humorous a little bit surreal but at the back of it all, there's some seriously thought out lyrics and music and, and uh, you know, played very well by the members of the band who placed extraordinary trust in me to be presenting them with music that um, in many ways might have been confusing to them. So uh, I had to pretend that it was not confusing to me and that I knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> I was, I was uh, making it up literally as I went along. <laughs> but I also I, I, I've been researching a bit uh, you know for this interview and I've been listening to some other interviews and reading this Thick as a Brick album and it's quite hysterical and I, I feel you have a great wit about you that British wit like if you weren't in Jethro Tull you could have ended up being in Monty Python or something like that well I think Monty Python at the time was um, probably enjoying it. it's um, it's first and very strong level of popularity in the UK, it hadn't really uh, made it to the USA or other countries, but in, in the UK it was becoming very popular. And that British humour was not just Monty Python. It started many years before that with a series of... In, in the post-war era, in fact, there was uh, a lot of British humour that was, I think, rather peculiarly British that uh, found its way into radio and then into television Monty Python were just the manifestation of that rather surreal British humour that came about in the early 70s. Right. And uh, that, you know, fitted the, the mood of the times. I think we were all in some way infused by that feeling of it being a national humour. It was it definitely always was about Britishness. It very rarely sort of touched upon other cultures, other stereotypes. Um, so it was, you know, we felt safe lampooning uh, elements of British culture, but you wouldn't dare do that if, you know, you wouldn't do that about America <laughs> or Russia or other places because it would be a little, a little 
impolite to do right. that. So we, we we leave it for you guys to make fun of yourselves, <laughs> and uh, and and we just concentrate on making fun of ourselves, which I think is the right and proper thing to do. Later on, you did a, a number two, thick as a brick number two. So did you ever consider? I, I was thinking this would make like a great play. Did you ever think of producing this as a play? No, I I, I, I have a, on a couple of occasions written music which was potentially something that could be developed into either a movie or a theatre piece. And, well, you know, it, it's it's nice to think that maybe you could do that, but it is a very, very specific discipline. I don't think I have the experience, the talent, or the uh, certainly not the credentials to do it. And um, I would probably, it's rather like, you know, stepping out of doing what you do and taking on some completely different role that you might think you can do it, but if you're doing it based on the fact that you're successful in a given area, then probably people are not going to take you seriously. I mean, if right. I was to suddenly decide I wanted to be an actor, I don't think people would take that very seriously. They would, they would, they would rightly guess perhaps I was getting a role because I was well-known for something else. Right. And indeed, there have been times when I was offered parts in in movies or theater and you know I, I had to turn them down just because i just i just knew what the end result would be that people would would jump on me for daring to try and do something different and there were other people much better qualified than i to uh, to do those roles and i stepped to one side and said no i'm not your man try so and so <laughs> yeah it's like when um actors now try to be musicians there's a lot of that going on as well there certainly are, yes, and I mean everybody. Everybody wants to be, you know, a guitar player and a rock band, and you know, if you're Johnny Depp or whoever it might be, then of course it's a lot of fun to get up there and hack away at the guitar. If you're uh, John McEnroe, you know, it's, it's <laughs> a lot of fun to do that. But of course, however, they might at some point have fantasized that maybe it's an alternative uh, way of making a living. I, I think the reality is that they know full well it is just a bit of fun. No one's <laughs> going to take them too seriously right, right, because right. they're actors and we don't trust them because we know that they're a fake. That's they make their, make their, make their whole, their, their whole shtick is to pretend. Yeah. And, you know, generally we, we like our musicians and rock stars to be the real deal. You know, we, yes. we I think we're a bit suspicious of actors taking on that role and acting rock star. It's not, not the real thing. Exactly. So now I want to congratulate you for being married for like something like 40 years to the same woman. That's basically unheard of in the music business. And uh, how did you manage this? Oh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, my, I'm lucky in having a family that, uh, you know, we work together. We're, um, uh, it's, it's been for many, many years, just a natural extension of doing things together i share an office with my wife she's um um someone that's worked with me since uh 1970 well the end of 1973 i think she she began working as a pr person at uh, the record company and so represented us in media and so on and then and then uh became our essentially our administrator in the office looking after the practical issues of um of of making things happen and um and we got into a relationship got married had children and we we've been working together ever since so she 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 just does the US tours she's a she's an accountant so she looks after all the financial issues and um and uh you know I keep out of the way of that it's uh, her territory, and I, I, I do my things from the other side of the office, like organizing uh, the musical side of things. And although I, I do rather enjoy being a travel agent on Sundays, <laughs> usually because I'm mostly in the office alone on a Sunday, so I can sit down and book a lot of airplane flights and hotels and do tour itineraries and things that I actually find quite fun to do. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, I want, you have, you mentioned you have kids, you have this, uh, estate, a country estate in England and you have pets and all this stuff, but uh, kids can most times be the harshest critics. Like what did they say about Jethro Tull and the costumes, the cod pieces, all of that stuff? 
Uh, sorry, do, who says what about it? Your kids, uh, when they were oh, growing kids. up. No, you, uh, children, yes. Right. Yeah, goats have kids. <laughs> people have children. That's my wife <laughs> is always telling people. Um, yes, they, um, well, you know, that's what you've grown up with. That, that's what all you know, and um, you just take it for granted. That's what your dad does. So it's it's not so different, I suppose. Other children might have parents who are school teachers or lawyers or... Um, I, I know when my my son-in-law, who's an actor, he he dropped uh, dropped his daughter off at her first day at school, and and she was um, met by another little girl in her class, and they they walked off together, and the other little girl looked back at my son-in-law and said, "Oh, is that your is that your daddy?" And my my granddaughter said, "Yes, it is." And and so the other little girl said, "Well, what does he do?" And my granddaughter said. Oh, he cuts the heads off zombies. <laughs> uh, uh, so, because because my son-in-law is a, a, one of the walking dead. Yes, actually. of so course. Um, that, that's what he does for a living, you see, as far as my granddaughter. Oh, he kills zombies. Exactly. You know, in a very matter-of-fact way. That's nice. Yeah, that's what he does. <laughs> and, um, you know, children will just tend to take these things for granted, like there's nothing very special about it. Right. So they don't grow up with a sense of being particularly different. It just is... You know the, the world they've grown into. It seems quite quite normal. You know, my grandchildren have been to where did they come? They, last time they they came to a show in uh, in Austin, in Texas, and um, and so my my wife, when she was much younger, she she worked on the merch stand sometimes selling T-shirts, and so my daughter and my son, when they were quite young. You know, young teenagers. They they also worked on the merch stand selling T-shirts. So I thought, well, we, we must manage another generation. So in Austin, Texas, if you bought a T-shirt from the merch stand, it would be sold to you by my nine-year-old granddaughter or my seven-year-old grandson, who were busy <laughs> uh, counting money and and uh, coming up with the usual spiel when someone said, "Wait, wait a minute, uh, uh, you, you, you've got a large there, but but I'm uh, I'm XL. Do you have any XL? My granddaughter would say, "Oh no, don't worry. That the, 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 these are cut on the large side. It'll fit perfectly." <laughs> then the next person comes along and says, uh, um, "I see you've got large, but you know I'm kind of more of a medium." And he said, "Oh no, no, it'll 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 shrink in the wash. It'll be it'll fit you perfectly." <laughs> so she she, le- she learned the um, the schmutter spiel. Uh, very quickly to right, uh, right. make sure she got a sale. <laughs> so, yeah, so you, you mentioned Andrew Lincoln is your son-in-law, and as I was doing research, I just discovered that last night, too, that that's my favorite show, and I had no idea. So are you a fan of the show? Do you watch it every week? Well, that's exactly what I was asked last Friday by um, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, said, do you watch the show? <laughs> we, 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 we were filming an episode of, of Norman Reedus's program called ride okay and so jeffrey and norman and andy were all at our place and we were riding bikes around the farm in the rain and getting very muddy and wet and uh, so uh, then we we were sitting having uh, some takeaway indian food being filmed by a 20 strong film crew and uh, jeffrey said uh, do you watch the walking dead and i said well hey you know i go back you know, unlike you, I go back to episode one, series one, and I was not only did I see it, but I was there when when uh, when uh, that first episode was being filmed because I happened uh-huh. to be doing a show in Atlanta that night. We went out and watched uh, the uh, the very opening scenes that my son-in-law shot um, in uh, the episode one of The Walking Dead, and then we we saw the completed episode one when it was. Um, given a, a private screening in London. Oh. And uh, so, yeah, I, I go right back to the very beginning and the the original cast members. But um, over the years, you know, the chances are I'm I'm somewhere else. I don't see it. It's on at right. the time of night. I don't get to see it. And I, I, I've missed so many episodes. I have <laughs> no idea. Um, I, I did I did see the first episode where, where uh, Jeffrey playing Negan right. in his opening, his first his first scene. And he was incredibly nervous about it, apparently. And I sent a message saying, hey, don't worry. You know, this, this is the best thing to happen in The Walking Dead for years. You know, yeah. your character and the way you play it is just so good. And um, 
you know, he was, uh, I think he was quite pleased to get past that, that first one, N- knowing that because he, his opening um, episode was where he had to kill off two of the relatively long-standing members, yes. well, particularly Stephen Young had been, uh, been there from the beginning. And um, so, yeah, he was very, he was really worried that he, all the Walking Dead fans would absolutely hate him. But um, he, uh, you know, he won everybody because he's such a bad guy. Yeah. But in, of course, in real life, <laughs> he's just a real pussycat. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> he's just a, you know, he's he's a cheerful, fun kind of happy guy. And um, <laughs> so, as, you, as, uh, as they all are. Do you get any advances of what's going to happen? Can you tell me what's going to happen next episode so I don't have to wait? Well, the, the answer to that one is that I never ask that question because I think it's, it, it, you know, there's, there's a great deal of very, very tight-lipped silence goes yeah. on. And I have to remember that the actors, in fact, they, they, they only get to read a script maybe the, the week before they're shooting, yeah. and they find out if they're going to live or die. And in many cases, you know, the, the script is handy to the actors, and, and two days later they, they, they get eaten by zombies and it's over. And it's it's a, a hugely traumatic thing for for those who suddenly find they've been written out of the script for yeah. theatrical dramatic purposes. Um, of course, it has nothing to do with their contracts and the fact that they might come and ask for more money. Um, but it's it is uh, you know it is a it is a difficult situation for everybody because the security around the set is very very tight because there are always those folk who want to you know know what's going to happen next, and of course they can't resist. Yeah. being uh, spoilers and putting it you know online and whatever else so yeah. i i know better than to ask <laughs> having even... said that having said that i do know stuff <laughs> but it's not it's not stuff that i i feel that would be ever appropriate to talk about right. because i wouldn't even want to you know, know you, you, you know should, it you, ruins should, the show. You, you should be on the edge of your seat not really knowing what's going to happen exactly yeah, it'll ruin the show if you know what's going to happen no point watching yeah. So, yeah, um, but I, I did say to, I did say to Norman Reedus, I said, well, "When when are you and my son-in-law? When are you going to have your broke back mountain moment <laughs> in The Walking Dead?" And he said, "Hey, listen," he said, "I'm up for it. I've I've I've, I've been I've been pushing for this for years that we should have a you know we should have a little kind of thing." He said, "I'm I'm I'm really up for it." But the in the writers' room, they're terrified of. Um, the reaction of the fans. <laughs> if it uh, turns out that Norman and Rick are getting it on, <laughs> I said, "Well, well, that's good, though. You know, you've got to, got to, got to make these people sit up and take notice and not get too cozy with their belief about human nature and characters and whatever." And uh, it's, it's it's something that The Walking Dead has stayed resolutely away from. There's been no real kind of. Um, gay character. Well, and, well, see, uh, you missed it. There is a couple now. Well, it it, it it sneaked in, I'm told, but I must have missed those episodes. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yes, it's uh, it's something where there's, um, I, I think any of the main characters, it's it's been talked about. I'm not the only person to have suggested it, but it's been mm-hmm. talked about and it decided that. Um, we couldn't risk the fan reaction <laughs> if we yeah. found, if we found out that uh, particularly Norman and Rick were yeah. playing sticky bottoms together. That, would not go down well. <laughs> that might be tough. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. hey, they often um, have like guest stars as zombies. Do you ever think about that going in makeup and becoming one of the zombies for an episode? Well, there are a lot of people who apparently clamor to do that and offer their services. I mean, you know, well known. Other actors and you know, people in the public. I would love to go on set and be a zombie. My, my, my son actually was uh, spent a, a full day starting at some ridiculously early hour in the morning, being made up for you know six hours or whatever it took to do, and then was was in a, a scene, um, crowd zombie scene, and in, in, in which he um, attacked. Uh, uh, I forget who it was, one of the main guys, and and it was a you know, real close up sort of hacking. He got you know seriously killed, and um, and unfortunately Frank Darabont, the producer, a director rather, when he saw the rushes, because it's shot on film, and they 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 get the rushes, it's everything is shipped out and shipped back, and it's uh, it's very. Um, 
um, after the fact, you know, when 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 they see you know, a day or two days later, they'll see what's been shot, and for whatever reason, Frank didn't like that scene and just binned it. It all ended up literally on the cutting room floor. So my son-in-law, apart from a a, a still image of him in makeup, you know, he, he just um, he got unlucky. Spent all that time doing uh, being a zombie for a you know. Hundred fifty dollars or whatever he got paid, <laughs> all, all a waste of time and effort. <laughs> so no, not not my cup of tea. Yeah. I'm uh, I, argu- arguably I probably wouldn't need as much makeup. But um, uh, so um, I, I want to talk. Switch back to music for a bit now. Here, so every year you have these yearly Christmas shows in England. Yeah, you play at churches for benefits and things like that. Have you ever considered bringing it? Because I would love to go to this, but I can't get to England. Um, so would you think about doing it in New York City, uh, like a tour? I have looked at um, doing cathedrals, well, or big churches in, in other countries, and I can do it in uh, in northwestern Europe and in Scandinavia where – Luther, the Lutheran Church, which is a reformist church that has um, a relatively open-minded view about musical liturgy and the use of churches and cathedrals for um, more secular performances, um, it's possible there. It's not possible, by and large, within the Catholic uh, world because uh, of an edict of Rome going back to 1980. Seven was it when it was said that there should be no music performed in Catholic churches unless it was part of the approved traditions of of uh, of, of, of the music of the of the church, literally absolutely purest religious music, mm. and was solely music about worship. It couldn't be just vaguely spiritual. Mm. And uh, also that you couldn't have a paying audience. And the reason I do this is is to raise money for buildings, you know, to for the, the maintenance and upkeep. So, I know you probably have to go soon. So um, yes, I do. You want to talk about the tour before you go? What uh, what can we expect? Well, very briefly, yes. I mean, sure. the, the nature of this tour is really paying homage to 36 other members of Jethro Tull over the years. And focuses uh, to a large extent on the first 10 years of Jethro Tull, which is when we were becoming known to most people in most parts of the world. And I think even younger fans who are discovering Jethro Tull for the first time today will will likely choose to go and check out the music from that period when we were the 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 spearheading of of a new music form, you know, in terms of more progressive rock music. So, I think they they will always be drawn to to uh, that era when um, I suppose we were we were becoming not exactly fashionable, but you know, we were shiny and new, and people were excited about it. So, I'm concentrating on that because it's this is a a 50th anniversary tour, not for me. It's a 50th anniversary tour to celebrate the 50th anniversary for the fans because it's all about what they were doing back then, what, what, where, where they were, what they listened to, how, what, what were they doing? Were they at school? Were they working? You know, it's it's them getting in touch with their lives of 50 years ago. I think that's the attraction of that kind of an anniversary because it's a bit weird for me if I'm getting up and playing a song that. I might have written 50 years ago and I'm getting up and playing it. You know, it doesn't, it's not in my head that this is a song that's taking me back 50 years. It's taking me back 24 hours because that's the last time I played it. (laughs) And so for me, the music isn't kind of connected in that way in the temporal sense. It's music that it's as old as last time I played it. And so, you know, a lot of these songs I've been playing over the years and, um, they don't. They don't necessarily have for me that, that feeling of nostalgia. They're songs that I choose to play because I think they're relevant lyrically, and I find them still speaking for me as uh, as music and lyrics today. And so I don't really think about them necessarily as being from a a time gone by. Any more than I think if you're a member of a classical music orchestra and you're playing some piece of music. You know, written by Mozart. You're not um, 
you're not necessarily thinking about some time, um, you know, 250 years ago, you were <laughs> thinking about now. Yeah, yeah and, um, absolutely. Mu- music has that advantage, really, of, of transcending um, the the temporal restrictions that perhaps apply in other areas of life. It is truly a timeless art form. Right, and it can bring people together. You know, you have, uh, you know, the country's divided, but we can all get together and uh, listen to the same music, though. Well, that that's right. It is most primitive. Music is about the celebration of of society. It tends to be something, whether it's sung around the campfire in the most primitive music forms that we know of. And, of course, these days, if you go to some huge rock concert with a vast amounts of sound and lights and, and the Rolling Stones... Um, amble onto stage for perhaps their final tour, then it may seem like a, a very far away world from the origins of music. But in essence, I think it's it's the same thing. It's people getting together around the around that notional um, focus where they they share some experience together. And in the same way, I suppose you do when you go to watch a sports event. Exactly. Yeah. You're sharing this with the fans of a football team or a basketball team, or you know, it's 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 something that we we have in our spirit. It's a, it's in our nature, isn't it? It's it's the same as I suppose going to church and singing and and being together with other people in this sort of sense of community safety you know it's a comfort zone that you embrace because you're with like-minded people and uh, that's always going to be attractive except for me because i'm a party pooper i'm a loner i don't go to <laughs> concerts or events or things i'm i feel uncomfortable uh-huh. i'm i'm i tend to tend to tend to uh you know tend to be rather solitary and not really enjoy um those kind of events. I, I went to a Rolling, con- a Rolling Stones concert once at Wembley Stadium many years ago, and I, I lasted about I don't know, not even twenty minutes. I just couldn't cope with all the noise and the crowds and the <laughs> craziness of it all. I just oh, really? it was so wow. loud and noisy, and I just I just said to my wife, "Can we go? I'm not enjoying this." Uh, you mentioned the Rolling Stones. I, I want to ask you one final question here. Um, you were part of the Stones Rock and Roll Circus back in the early days there. Do you have any memories of recording that? Oh, I have a lot of memories of being there, yes, and um, and uh, memories of uh, you know working alongside the Stones and watching them and learning a little bit about things, particularly watching Mick Jagger and his hugely energetic and committed um pushing everybody to uh to uh do their best and you know he was he was um i i guess probably the the, the only member of the stones who really knew what was going on and they seemed a little bemused by it all and just going with the flow because this is what mick was was um um you know, had to be in his bonnet about making as a TV program, and you know, but but you know they 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 were they they during the course of rehearsal they they upped their game and they were they were pretty good, um, and uh, an example I suppose in professionalism and hard work, uh, as were the Who who were there as well. They were they were well um, well polished and just you know at the top of their game anyway, and, and ready rehearsed and performance ready whereas the stones hadn't played live for quite a while when they did that show but um yeah i remember a lot about it and some of it some of it amusing some of it good some of it not so good and um it was just a couple of days of my life where i just you know stood kind of watching what was going on we 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 had a very small part to play in it because we were the rookie band that um represented that um element of something knew that no one had heard of before. I think Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman had kind of put us, put our name forward to make as being a band that could come and do it and wouldn't need to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, well, it's been a great career. I want to thank you for calling in, and I want to thank you for the music, too. It's uh, given me a lot of pleasure and joy over the years. I love you guys, and I'm going to be checking you out on the tour in New York City. I'm going to be seeing you at the Beacon Theater, so I'm looking forward to that. All right, yeah. 
Yes. Okie dokie. Well, we look forward to seeing you there, too. Yes. And uh, thanks for talking to me, and take care. We'll see you soon. All right, great. Have a great tour. Okay, but cheers. Bye-bye now. Bye.